bad of each other or other, other Muslims who may differ with us. And the second half of the book is uh, around that principle, ikhtilaf or ummati rahma, that differences of opinion, not in the fundamentals, but in the detailed, in the furu, uh, is a mercy for my ummah. And also, la inkar fi masail al khilaf, or la inkar fi masail al ijtihad al sa'ir. That there should be no censuring or condemning each other in issues of legitimate differing. Those are the uh, themes of the book, inshallah. Uh, the golden rule of differing is the main point of the book, but I use the 15th night of Sha'ban as an example because uh, it has caused a lot of problems and continues to do. So, with that being said, I'd like to start by saying Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim inna alhamdulillah na'hamaduhu wa nasla'inu wa nasta'gfiru wa na'udhu billahi min shuroori anfusina wa min sayyati amalina may yahdihillahu falamudilla la wa may yudlil falahadiya la wa ashadu an la ilaha illa allahu wahdahu la sharika la wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluhu amma ba'am So what's the issue? The issue is we're in the month of Sha'ban which is one month before the month of Ramadan. And there are some hadith that speak about the, blessed, uh, the blessings of Sha'ban as a month. There are hadith that speak about the blessings of the 15th night of Sha'ban in particular. In fact, Imam al-Bayhaqi has collected over 30, 40 or perhaps even 50 such hadith. And he, like the majority of scholars, have told us that the vast majority of these hadiths are not authentic and cannot be ascribed to the Prophet wasallam. But there are a few of them, two, three, four, five, six, that actually can be ascribed to the Prophet wasallam. And these hadiths, it are, some of these hadiths are the hadiths that I'd like to start with in our discussion. But on the other hand, just to let you know, there are a few scholars throughout history who are adamant that none of the hadiths, there are hadiths, but none of the hadiths that speak about the virtues of the 15th night of Sha'ban, the middle night of Sha'ban, and in Arabic they'll say, Laylatul Nifs min Sha'ban, none of them are authentic according to a minority opinion of scholars, uh, experts in hadith. So those who say that none of the hadith of Sha'ban can be authentically attributed to the Prophet Sallallahu then as far as they're concerned, there is nothing in the Qur'an and nothing in the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu that speaks about the fadail, the virtues <coughs> of this night. And therefore this night is like any other night. However, other scholars, they say actually there are, there are some authentic hadiths. We believe those hadiths are authentic. And since they are authentic, it means we can definitely say the Prophet said this and that about the virtues, the fadail of the 15th night of Sha'ban. And since he وسلم, spoke about the virtues of the 15th night of Sha'ban, it means that that night has a special merit or distinction. So what are these hadiths? Let's, let's mention two or three of these hadiths as a starter. In the Musnad of Ahmad and the Sunan of Tirmidhi and the Sunan of uh, Ibn Majah, uh, we have this hadith in which it says that the Prophet وسلم, said, إن الله تبارك وتعالى ينزل ليلة النصف من شعبان إلى السماء الدنيا فيغفر لأكثر من عدد شعر غنم كلب. That the Prophet, uh, the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said, Allah exalted is He descends to the nearest heaven in the middle night of شعبان and He is more forgiving than there are the number of hairs on the backs of the sheep. In the tribe of Kalb. This hadith is in the Musnad of Ahmad and also in the well known Sunan of Tirmidhi and Ibn Majah. That Allah uh, Ta descends to the nearest heaven in the middle night of Sha'ban, Laylatul Nismin Sha'ban, and he is more forgiving 
the, on that night than there are the number of hairs on the back of the sheep in the tribe of Kalb. Now, Kalb was a very prosperous Arab tribe at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. They didn't have a few sheep. They didn't have 10 or 20 sheep. They had hundreds of sheep. And if you could just imagine one sheep and how many hairs there are on their back. And, and the Prophet ﷺ is saying in this hadith that Allah is more forgiving than the number of hairs. It gives you an idea that Allah is exceptional. Allah is forgiving anyway. He's, he's Ghafoor Rahim anyway. But Allah in His wisdom and His grace and His bounty is even more forgiven in some times of the month. For example, the month of Ramadan, Allah is more forgiven. He's forgiving anyway, but in the month of Ramadan, even more forgiving. Allah is more forgiving in Ramadan, but in the last 10 nights of Ramadan, He's even more forgiven. So there are things like that that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala <coughs> does. And He is more forgiving on that night than the number of hairs on the tribe of Kalb. And that's according to many hadith scholars, and it's possible to be the, actually it could be the majority of hadith scholars, uh, including some modern hadith scholars like uh, Sheikh Shu'ayb al Naud, Sheikh Muhammad Nasruddin al Albani, uh, Sheikh uh, Al Mubarak Puri, uh, and, and before that, Imam, uh, Imam Tirmidhi himself and others declare this hadith to be either Hassan or Sahih. And likewise, Ibn Rajab. Uh, says the same, Al-Iraqi has something similar, Ibn Taymiyyah rahmatullah alayhi has something similar. And there are many other hadith uh, scholars who have said the same. Another hadith from Abu Musa al-Ashari and in Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qal, inna allaha liyattali'u laylata nifsi min sha'ban fi yaghfiru li jami'i khalqihi illa li mushrikin aw mushahin. That Allah looks at his creation during the middle night of Sha'ban and he forgives all of them. He forgives all of them. Except a mushrik and a mushahin. Except an idolater. Here it means a non-Muslim. And a mushahin. Someone who harbors a grudge or enmity against his Muslim brother or sister. Someone who is either a mushrik or a mushahin. Someone who has enmity, nafra, bughd, hirt, hatred in his heart rank or ill will in his heart against a, another Muslim, then they're excluded. Allah forgives his creation. And then there is another hadith uh, from the lady Aisha radiallahu anha, who said, <coughs> uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, do you know what night this is? I said, Allah and his messenger know best. So he said, this is the middle night of Sha'ban. Allah Jalla wa ala looks at his servants during the middle night of Sha'ban and he forgives those who ask for forgiveness is merciful to those who ask for his mercy, but postpones it for all those who harbor rancor or ill will in that state. And there are other hadith, but these three hadith, at least scholars have, many scholars have authenticated two or three of these hadith. So those scholars, and they seem to be the majority, who have authenticated it, they say, therefore, when Allah says, I am more forgiving on this night, why does he tell us? They say, he tells us simply because he, they, Allah wants us to do something on this night that draws us closer to this mercy and this blessed forgiveness. And on that basis, that is why it seems like the majority of uh, the ummah, those who subscribe to Sunni Islam, uh, past and present, there's the scholars and the lay people have been encouraged to revive worship and do acts of nawafil, acts of optional prayer, optional Quran, Quran reading, dhikr of Allah, making a lot of dua and istighfar, seeking Allah's forgiveness on that night. And this is a legitimate opinion. It's not a dodgy opinion. It's not a deviant opinion that this is some, uh, some innovator has innovated it. It's actually an opinion based upon authentic hadith, backed up by many of the fuqaha, the jurists. On the other hand, as I said, there are a few scholars, not majority, but a few scholars throughout the ages, who consider even these hadith not to be authentic. 
But that is a minority opinion. But it's an acceptable opinion. If, for example, I'm a layman and I, my sheikh that maybe that I trust and I follow, he's my scholar or he's a scholar that I'm familiar with, and I ask him, uh, uh, what do you say about the hadith? And he says, oh, I believe they're to be all weak. There's nothing authentic from the Prophet ﷺ about uh, the Laylut and Ismin Sha'ban. Therefore, treat it like any other night. Then that's a valid opinion. That too should be respected. However, as I said, there are these hadiths there. Most hadith scholars have authenticated one or more of these hadiths. And therefore, as early as the Tabi'un, as the second generation of Muslims onwards, we find the practice of adhering to these hadiths and actually establishing worship on this night. Sometimes we find some of the Tabi'un doing it in congregation, jama'an. But we, it seems to be that the normal practice is ifradan, individually, Make, make some extra nawafil prayer, do some dhikr, recite some Qur'an, and then finish it all with asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness and tawbah and well-being and goodness and guidance. That's really the issue. And we could actually say, mashallah, alhamdulillah, and we could all go home. <laughs> alhamdulillah. But that's as simple as it is. Now, uh, the reason why I wrote this book, uh, and I use the Sha'aban issue, is for two reasons. Uh, one, because uh, many, many years ago, 15 odd years ago, maybe, maybe longer than that, 20 years ago, I was, taught that, uh, I was taught that staying awake through worship and ibadah on the middle night of Sha'aban is a bid'ah, it's dodgy, it's deviant. And for a few years, this is what I, uh, I not only believed, uh, but also, I kind of, you can't help it, because when you're taught in a particular way, and sometimes it does matter how you're taught. So if I told you today, the 15th night of Shaban, all the hadith, all, they're all weak, they're all munkar, batil, mawdu. There's no such basis in Islam. Now those of the elders, they'll think, oh, mashallah, Allah is a bit excited. But some, some of the people my age or even younger, they'll think, well, this is a serious issue because the sheikh is really a bit passionate. Therefore, there's no such thing as celebrating Sha'ban. And though if you then, therefore, when you walk out the masjid and you see someone or you hear of someone celebrating it, you think, oh, poor man, jahil, he doesn't know. Or maybe he's a bit dodgy. And maybe the masjid he goes to is a bit dodgy. And there is some kind of ill will that begins. To, why? Because... The way I said it and the way it was taken. That was something which happened to me. I don't excuse myself. I'm still responsible. <coughs> but if it was said, Alhamdulillah, two opinions, and we take the opinion that the hadith are all weak, so don't celebrate the night, don't... There'd have been no problem. And then you see others who are doing it, following the other opinion, and the unity would have still been there. The unity would have still been there. That's important. It's important that we do not deny any haq, any truth. Therefore, if in the sharia, if in, uh, uh, in the sharia that the Prophet ﷺ came with, something is clearly haram, we have to accept it's clearly haram. If something in the sharia of the Prophet ﷺ is clearly halal, clearly lawful, we have to accept it as clearly lawful. But if, if something in the sharia of the Prophet ﷺ is not clear, because the Prophet ﷺ said something and maybe the Sahaba understood this, that same word or the same words in two different ways, then here we have an obligation either as a scholar to follow what we think to be the right opinion and as a follower of a scholar, a layperson, to trust our scholar and be tolerant about the other opinion. I'll give you an example. In Sayyid Bukhari, and you've heard this before, the Prophet ﷺ said, uh, in a particular battle, it was a very heavy battle. He said, whoever believes in Allah and the last day, let him not pray Salatul Asr until he reaches the area of Banu Quraidah. And rest, and, until he reaches the Jewish settlement of the, of the Quraidah, Quraidah tribe. And the companions, they had just come back from a battle, lasted 10, 15 odd days and they were very tired 
And sorry, the 29 day Barakal, the whole month, they, the, the battle. And it was a very difficult battle. And so they made their way to south of Medina, down south in Medina, uh, a f quite a few miles out, but still within the overall thing uh, considered to be near enough to Medina, were the Jewish tribes and settlements of Banu Qurayda, quite a long distance. It would have taken them. They're really tired and been fighting for a whole month. And also they've been starved as well for uh, at least 10 or 15 of those days. So they're off they go. So Banu, because he who believes in Allah, in Allah in the last day, let him not pray Asr until he reaches Banu Qurayda. So off they went. As they're going, Asr time starts. And they're still going, and they haven't reached this place. And now they're still traveling, they haven't reached it, and Asr is finishing. The time for Asr is going. One group of the Sahaba said, SubhanAllah, we, I mean, they didn't use exactly these words, but I'm making mafhum here, making the rough meaning. They said, SubhanAllah, we've done, we have done our best. We're, tr we're walking or traveling as fast as we can so that we can reach Banu Qurayza in time for Asr, but we've done our best, and Asr time is nearly finishing, and Maghrib is nearly coming in, we better stop and we better pray uh, Asr now. Because the Prophet he didn't mean miss Asr prayer out of its time. What he meant, they said, is that you should travel so fast, you'll get there for Asr. But we did our best, and we didn't get there for Asr. So we'll pray Asr, and then we'll continue to get to Banu Qurayza. One group of Sahaba stopped and they prayed. Another group of Sahaba said, we understand that. But we believe that on this occasion, the Prophet ﷺ has given us an exception, an istithna. And the situation is so severe that we are actually excused from praying Asr until we get to Banu Quraidah, whatever time. And so they prayed Asr out of the normal time that we expect Asr to be prayed. When the, and they got to Banu Quraidah and they prayed Asr. Here is the point. When the Prophet ﷺ heard about the, the actions of both, he didn't criticize, censure, or tell off any of the group, any of the two parties. Now, if something was wrong, we should understand the, the, the way of, this, of the Sunnah. If something was clearly haram or against Islam, it would have been the duty of the Prophet ﷺ to point it out to us. Because he, one of his duties is to make haq clear from batil. The pleasure of Allah clear from his displeasure. But he kept silent. And normally, the taqreer, the silence of the Prophet ﷺ means that it's allowed. It's, there's nothing haram that's gone on there clearly. But look at, look at the language. He who believes in Allah and the last day, let him not pray Asr until he reaches Banu Quraida. You'd think it's quite simple. But actually, no. Ikhtilafu fahm. The Sahaba, radiallahu anhum ajma'een, they differed, not in did the Prophet say it or not, because they heard it from him, alayhi salatu wasalam. So it's like a sahih hadith. But they differed on what does it mean, the ma'na. The interpretation. So when that is the case, then you have a hadith here about the 15th of Sha'ban where the difference is not about the interpretation. The difference is, did the Prophet ﷺ genuinely say these words? That is to say, is the hadith or are the hadiths about it authentic or not authentic? Sahih or not? And depending upon that, is the end to answers, but there should never be any criticism. One of the reasons I wrote it I also is that over the last 15 years I noticed, and I used to get it on my email until I unsubscribe, <coughs> is that I used to get these, <coughs> this, uh, this email about a week before, or a, uh, two weeks before the 15th of Sha'adan, Bid'a alert, Bid'a alert, Bid'a alert, and the heading is Bid'a alert, Bid'a alert, Bid'a alert. And then it would say uh, 15th of Sha'ban, not allowed, haram, innovation, da 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 da. And it had, sometimes it would have some other strong words. And what I noticed was wow, people, when they find mosques or individuals or even sheikhs and scholars who believe that the 15th of Sha'ban is okay, you'll find some of the Shabab, it's like, uh, what rubbish scholar he is. 
that masjid is deviant. He's Ahlul Bid'ah. He's an innovator. And I would sometimes say to some of these brothers, MashaAllah, you know what? That would be good. Not really, I don't mean it literally. But that would be good if you were consistent. They said, what do you mean consistent? Well, you're saying he's a deviant. You're saying that's a dodgy mosque. And you're saying he's, that he's a deviant scholar because they celebrate the 15th of Sha'ban. So if I read to you, for example, if I tell you, for example, and I'm, I'll read off here, uh, here is a fatwa. If a person offers prayer in the middle night of Sha'ban, whether individually or in a specific congregation, as was done by a group amongst the Salaf, فَهُوَ أَحْسَنْ Then this is excellent. And if I tell you that's Imam Ibn Taymiyyah, will you also put Imam Ibn Taymiyyah in the camp of dodgy, deviant, ahlul bid'ah, misguided, whatever? And many of them are like, oh. I said, no, you can't excuse him and then crit either celebrating it is so dodgy and deviant it makes you an innovator. That means everybody who believes that should be. But no, you're not going to be like that. You're picking and choosing. The reality is this is not an issue to declare Ahlul Bid'a or Ahlul Sunnah. This is a difference. This difference is no different then. Shall I go down in Ruku, uh, in Sajda, with my knees before my hands? Or shall I put my hands down before my knees? Difference of opinion. Why? The Prophet said, let none of you go down like a camel goes down. And then one narration says, but let him put his hand before his knees. But that same hadith has been transmitted with, let him place his knees before his hands. Yani, there is a charge of inqilab in that hadith, that one of the narrators has turned the hadith the other way around, or, and scholars have differed. Is it that way, or is it that way? And then the difficulty about the camel is it goes down in a way that maybe its knees are its hands, or its hands are its knees, according to the badu. Okay? And so, for example, the, the Shafi'is, Mathalan, will say uh, hands before knees. And, for example, the Hanafis and the Hanabil and the Hanbalis will say knees before hands, for example. And that goes back, that difference goes back to Sahaba themselves. Ibn Umar, anhu, from what I remember, uh, and uh, Ibn Qudama mentions in the Mughni, his fatwa was hands before knees, and Ibn Masud, knees before hands. But they didn't split. Khalas, this was just an acceptable difference. He feared God as much as he could and trying to follow the sunnah as much as he thought is the sunnah and likewise him and their hearts were still together. Therefore, if anyone already takes an opinion in this issue because they have researched it or they trust their shaykh, then alhamdulillah, we celebrate the night or we don't celebrate the night. What we cannot do is split and have bad opinions. It's as simple as that. In fact, one could go as far as to say, Whoever makes this issue into an issue of tafarruq, splitting the ummah, has behaved like the Ahlul Bid'ah. I'm not saying he is an innovator, but has behaved like an innovator. Because one of the, uh, one of the trademarks of the innovators, the misguided Muslims, is that they split the ummah of the Prophet ﷺ in those things that Allah hasn't allowed it to be split. Now, the majority opinion, which is the one that I'm going to follow and the one that I'm going to teach, the majority opinion simply says, look, you don't ask the question, did the Prophet and the companions do it? You ask the question one of two ways. What is the Islamic hukum on the subject? Or does this action have a basis in our Sharia? The reason why we say we shouldn't ask, did the Prophet and the companions do it? is because our Sharia is not based upon only what the Prophet and the companions did. Of course, it's based upon that as well. But also, sometimes the Prophet may have said something to give an indication that something could be done, even if it wasn't done then. Or, or he gave an indication for, uh, uh, for a practice to be practiced, even though he may not have done it. For example, many scholars have said, and it's one of the positions in the Shafi'i school, and one of the positions in the Hanbali school, that actually, in a Jummah khutbah, since the goal of Jummah, uh, and this is not the Hanafi position, because the, the Hanafi say the, the goal of Jummah, the maqsad of Jummah, is, is, um, is dhikr of Allah, is remembrance of God. So as soon as you remember God in the Jummah khutbah, anyway, you fulfilled the, you fulfilled the point of khutbah. 
Other scholars, they say, no, the point, the maqsad of Jum'ah, the purpose of Jum'ah is not just dhikr, it's, it's actually uh, ta'leem and tathkir, it's a reminder. You have to be reminded. And therefore, in order to remind, you have to understand what is being said. So, some of the Shafi and Hamli scholars, not today, not of our time today, going back to at least two, three, four hundred years, say, if there ever is a situation, and there was never a situation in their time as far as they were concerned, because Islam and the Arabic language had to be dominant, whereby the people will not benefit from an Arabic khutbah, then as long as the khatib uh, praises Allah in Arabic, says Alhamdulillah or something like this, make shahada in Arabic, Ashhadu an Allah, Ashhadu an Muhammad Rasulullah. Make salawat on the Prophet ﷺ, durood in Arabic. Quotes at least one ayah in Arabic. And admonishes the people with taqwa. Inspires them to fear God in Arabic. Fattakullah, ittakullah. Then as long as he's done those five arkan, five pillars of the khutbah in Arabic, then whatever else he does in the local language is fine. That is an opinion, a minority opinion, in some of the madhabs. But not all of the madhabs. Where did they get that from? They didn't say, did the Prophet and the companions do it? Because the answer is, not only did they not do it, we didn't have an Arabic khutbah, uh, we didn't have a non-Arabic khutbah for 1400 odd years. But the issue is, does it have an asl in the sharia? Does it have a basis? And according to some scholars, it does have a basis, and the basis is, Tadkir, a reminder, should be understood and therefore it needs to be said in the language that the people, the majority of the people understand, providing the basic things have been done in Arabic. That's an opinion. It's a minority opinion, but it's a legitimate opinion, inshallah. Likewise, Laylatul Nism in Sha'aban. Well, these hadith. Allah is more forgiving on that night. Do the scholars say, do you think that Allah will say, the Prophet will tell us that Allah is more forgiving than on this night and we just sleep that night? Uh, the Laylatul uh, the, uh, uh, Qadr. Okay. Such a night of forgiveness. Khairu min al fishar. MashaAllah, Jazakallah khair. I know the 27th night, uh, let's just leave all the difference. 27th night is of Ramadan. Famous night, most greatest night in the year. Alhamdulillah. Oh, there has to be some targhib. It's a targhib, isn't it? It's, a, it's an encouragement. I am more forgiving on this night. Do something to draw closer to my forgiveness. Show something from you that you are my true slave and, and sincere slave. And that's exactly what the ulama did. And they just differed. Can you do that congregationally? Or do you do that individually? And it seems like, as Imam al-Suyuti says, and Ibn Taymiyyah has another fatwa on it, says it should be done individually. And that seems to be the, 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 the preferable opinion. But even if someone did it collectively, that's, they, have an, they have a salif. And this doesn't come 500, 10, 100 years, 1,000 years later. This comes from the time of the tabi'un, the students, some of the students of the sahaba. Therefore, two things. First, whenever I'm told a fatwa by a sheikh, or I read it in a book, or I hear it on telly. Alhamdulillah, let me act upon it. The sheikh is the sheikh, the fatwa is a fatwa, and knowledge is there to be acted upon. But at the same time, I should have it in my heart that actually, maybe there are other opinions, and maybe there are practices from other Muslims who are following other scholarly opinions, according to the, sun the book and the sunnah, Therefore, if I do see a Muslim doing something different than me, let me not condemn him. Let me not uh, suspect his Islam. Let me not question his adherence to uh, the Sunnah of the Prophet Let me just, maybe I can ask that, oh, why do you do that? And he'll say, oh, because uh, I, the Sheikh, you know, the Sheikh such and such, or in my madhab, the Hanbali madhab, it says this, or something like this. And then you know, oh, mashallah, he's on, he's on following scholarly knowledge. And you carry on doing what you're doing, he carries on doing what he, he does. But of course, if you come up to someone and he's practicing something in Islam and you say, Brother, mashallah, so how do you, why do you do this? He goes, I just do it. And you say, oh no, but do you do it because there's a, uh, the, uh, you know, some of the, uh, the, the Sahaba taught this? No, 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 no. 
of the imams, the great fuqaha, the imams, the ulama. No, 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 no. A uh, mufti gave you a fatwa? No, 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 no. I, I just made it up myself. Then, of course, you know, you have to sit down with them and you have to explain Islam is not something that you make up from the top of your head. It is something that is rooted in the teachings of the book and the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. But when there is already rooted with a hadith, 15th of Sha'ban, and many of these hadith scholars authenticate it, then either as a scholar, I can agree or disagree, especially not, not just a scholar, a scholar of hadith, or as a lay person, I trust my scholar. <laughs> For example, even if I were to read why scholars have, how scholars have authenticated the hadiths, it would be meaningless to us. If I told you, and I'm making this up, but yeah, just an example, Yahya uh, ibn uh, Sa'ad al Laythi, who narrated from Al um who narrated from Muhammad Ibrahim al Qurayshi, all of them are thicker, all of them are precise and trustworthy. Who's Yahya ibn Layth, Sa'id, Sa'id, and who is this Ibrahim al Quraysh, and who is this, this, and who? Makes no sense to us. We don't know these Rijal, these names of men. We wouldn't even know where to look up their biographies. <coughs> or if I said the other way around, that they are weak. Um, Yahya ibn Layth, Sa'adi, Su'ul Hifz, he had bad memory or poor memory. And uh, this one, Ibrahim al Quraysh, uh, he's been. Um, uh, he's been uh, uh, accused of uh, idraj in hadith. Even if I knew these terms, how would I know that that's a reality? We just trust our scholars on this. The Arabic term for that is taqlid. We just trust. Except because of their knowledge. If I'm just accepting on the knowledge, let's say I believe all the hadith are weak because my sheikh told me, or the, the fatwa that I read told me, or I watched it on the uh, on, on some satellite TV, Islamic satellite TV, and there was Sheikh that he looked like Sheikh and whatever, and he said haram, or he said the hadith are weak. And I, tried, I learned that. And then I come to Dr. Salim, and he's actually, he's read or heard on another TV program, or he's read in his book or from his Sheikhs, that actually you should, celebrate, you should make ibadah that night. How can I argue with him, or him argue with me, when I don't know anything about why hadiths are weak or not? And maybe he doesn't know as well. All I can say is, look, Dr. Sim, I, I trust the sheikh that I heard. No disrespect to you or your sheikh. Or I say, oh, really? Uh, what sheikh is that? And he says, sheikh. So I said, subhanAllah, that's a big sheikh. I don't know who this sheikh was. And I go over to his opinion. That can happen. But we couldn't be arguing. On what? I've got no background to argue. I can't say, oh, yeah, but the hadith are all weak. And I share, and Dr. Salim will say, really, Abu Ali? Where's your proof that they're all weak? Uh, but, but Sheikh said so. No, 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 so. Fine. But I'm saying another Sheikh has said something different. So what's the argument? And you'll find probably three quarters of the arguments that happen between Muslims about religious issues will vanish. Some years ago, no, not some years ago, 20 years ago, maybe. I don't want to embarrass anyone, and I forgive me if I might embarrass someone. I don't, my knee is not to embarrass someone. I was asked to, maybe, maybe by, uh, by someone here, maybe by someone else, but I, I can't remember. But I was asked, oh, why don't you come to, uh, with this particular group, uh, the group of Jama'at al Tabligh, Tabligh Jama'at, we say, and come away for uh, uh, 40 days or Actually, it was, it was actually um, um, three or four months, actually, that I was asked. Uh, I was asked previously about 40 days, three days, for, but this was this time I remember specifically. And I had just got into this Qur'an and Hadith and learning, and I was quite young then. And I, and I learned this one phrase, where's the proof, where's the proof, where's the proof? So that became like my mantra, my, my dhikr. Forget about subhanAllah, alhamdulillah, astaghfirullah, was, Aina dalil, aina dalil, hatu burhanakum in kuntum sadiqin, hatu burhanakum in kuntum sadiqin. Where's your proof if you're truthful? And so, brother comes to me. I said, where's your proof that you, we can go away for four months? And the brother's like, I just, I just, you know, the scholars, we've been doing this for tens of years or whatever. And no, no one's ever asked me. I said, if you don't know, then I can't do it. And we, many of us learned that. And we kind of, we excused ourselves from this. And one day, many years later, sitting in a majlis with some of the ulama, and I'm learning Babul Kital wa Jihad. 
don't need to go into that again. We had the whole topic on that before. <laughs> and it comes to an author, uh, a narration of Umar radiallahu anhu. Umar radiallahu asks his daughter Hafsa, who is one of the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and Hafsa radiallahu anha. And it's after the Prophet sallallahu passed away, and Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu passed away, and Umar radiallahu is caliph. And Umar radiallahu anhu is sending the uh, the mujahidun from Medina to wherever he's sending them, to the Byzantine Empire, to the Persian Empire, because they conquered in his time, and Egypt. And then a woman makes a complaint about she's, her husband's been away from her for so long. Where is he? Uh, you sent him, Amir al on, on the Ghazwa. He said, oh, and he hasn't come back yet? No, you haven't asked, him, you haven't asked them to come back. He goes, oh, and you're missing him yet? I am. So he goes to Hafsa anha, and he asks his daughter Hafsa this question. He says, Oh Hafsa, tell me, how long generally can a wife be away from a husband without any too much hardship? She said, Really, four months. And then Umar anhu, sends out letters to the various provinces and to the various uh, Amirs, Umara, that says, Whoever has traveled, uh, uh, whoever has been away cl uh, for uh, close to four months and it's going to take them, you know, they shouldn't be away, no mujahid should be away from four months because it's violating the haqq of the wife. And some ulama, whether it's right or wrong, I and mean, whether it's uh, ajr or ajran, whether they get two rewards for it or one reward, it's an ijtihad based upon an asl that if that is for jihad fi sabilillah, and dawah and tabligh, dawah and tabligh is a type of jihad, bila, bila khilaf, bila naza. If there is no difference of opinion amongst the ulama, that dawah and jihad is a type of, uh, dawah and tabligh is a type of jihad, but not jihad bil saif. It's jihad bil lisan or jihad bil qalam. But it is a type of. But they, there are some things they, uh, that are similar in, the, in between the two jihads, and there are some things that are totally separate. Okay? Then some of them have said, we can use that author to give a type of basis of our, going, of our going for four months. Now, some ulama will disagree with this ijtihad, but it is based on something. It's not like, oh, let me just think. And as regards to 40 days, there is a hadith. And, and by scholarly agreement, uh, it's got some weakness in it that whoever... Uh, either it says whoever remembers Allah for 40 days or whoever keeps his heart sincere for 40 days, the fountain of hikmah will spring for him, forth from him. And Imam Malik and a group of the Salaf said that if you do a practice for 40 days, you will become established in it and the taqwa will come from you. And, and actually psychologists say now that if you give up a bad habit for, I, I think they say 27 days, that that habit will be ingrained in you. Or if you do a good thing for 27 days, that habit will be ingrained in you. Or if you keep away from a bad habit for 27 days, inshallah, bil jumla, that habit will be ingrained in you. That's a psychological or psychologist psychology and a medical thing. So the ancients had this idea that when you do something for 40 days continuously, or keep away from something for 40 days continuously, it will be ingrained as an ada, as a habit. Okay, this is why many of the uh, people of Suluk and Tarbiyah will say, look, okay, uh, stay with us for uh, 40 days and pray your Fajr Jama'an <coughs> and uh, hopefully when you go back to your local masjid and whatever, you, that habit will be ingrained or at least waking up on time will be ingrained <coughs> even if you can't get to the masjid for some reason. Point being is, there is so much... Th so here I am. When I was mu uh, much younger... I'm mocking it. I didn't mock it with my tongue really, but there was a mockery. And the mockery is a type of arrogance, kibber. And then later on, five, six, seven years or however long, you, you find a, a basis. So what do you do? Oh, you have to make tawbah, of course. You have to make tawbah. But then you think, how many things do you have to make tawbah for? Really, let's not get into that situation. Our ulama generally, of course, sometimes an alim is a human being and he makes mistakes and he has some weakness. But on the whole, bil jumla, our ulama, Allah has really given tawfiq to. Because Allah has taught us through the tongue of the Prophet al ulama warathatul anbiya. The scholars are the inheritors of the prophets. And Allah has told us in the Quran that there will be no prophet any longer. After the Prophet there is no Nabi. 
And yet Allah knows that a religious people, a religious ummah, any religious ummah, ummah of Musa alayhi salam, ummah of Isa alayhi salam, ummah of Yaqub alayhi salam, ummah of Ibrahim alayhi salam, ummah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam, any ummah can, if they're around long enough, get affected with dunya. And some wrong things can be mixed in with religious knowledge and sharia. Now Allah knows that Allah is telling us no prophet after the Prophet and at the same time Allah is telling us that actually people will come who for one reason or the other they will mix falsehood in, re in correct religious knowledge. So what was the solution for that? Not another Nabi. Al-ulama warathatul anbiya. The ulama and the awliya, and by awliya I don't just mean the saints, but I mean the people of spiritual uh, uh, spirituality who have basic sharia knowledge. So the ulama and the, awliya of, uh, and the awliya of Allah, they are the people to revive the correct, the, the, to keep the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ and the teachings of the Quran alive. Even if individually there may be some weaknesses in their shortcoming, but as, as a whole. So we have to have a thicker, a confidence. And do you not see, especially you elders, you, sh you should know this better than us. Not because you witness it, but because you are closer to the time. When, when countries like our country, Britain, or France, or, po or, or, or the Portuguese, or whomsoever, or the French, they walked into Muslim lands, there were periods where they would try to have a military victory over the Muslims. And quite often that didn't occur. Quite often it was difficult to have a military victory. So they rethought their strategy. And one of the things that they rethought was, why is it that the Muslims are like this? Because they have a particular way of living and looking at the world. Where do they get it from? They get it from their scripture, the Quran and the teachings of the Prophet Well, how do they keep this alive? They keep it alive through the ulama, through the madaris, through the the, the, the majalis of the ulama, through the books of the ulama, for the teachings of the ulama and the awliya. Therefore, that's clear what to do. If we can disconnect the masses from their scholars, slowly and steadily, we can turn the hearts of the Muslims away from haq and from khair. And that's exactly what happened. And each one of us, each one of you, are responsible for turning that tide. Therefore, have a level of confidence in the ulama, but make a difference. There are young ulama, and there are seasoned ulama. The young Shafi'i, rahmatullah alayhi, when he is, uh, when he is 15, 16, maybe in the, in the circles of Imam Malik, it's not like the Shafi'i who is writing the Risala or, the, or, or, or Al Um in, even though Shafi'i was brilliant anyway, even at a young age. But you get the idea. Young ulama, I've graduated from a, a Darul Ulum or a university, Islam, you know, and I've done the, or, or, or Azhar, and I'm, I'm, I'm 21 or I'm 20. Mashallah, I'm going to have some knowledge. I'm an alim. But I, 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 that's not me. I didn't graduate. I just want to say, but I'm an alim. So, but. Compare that to an alim, who, a scholar who's been studying 40, 50, 60 years and his ibadah, his worship, and his weeping, and his dhikr, and his salawat, and his istighfar. Can you imagine the tawfiq, the guidance Allah would give that? He has scholarly knowledge and he's continuously <coughs> reading for 40 years and he has worship on top of that. SubhanAllah. He will be able to see things you and I will never be able to see. You know, Sheikh Abdul Qadir al Jilani, rahmatullahi one of the, uh, the works that he has is called Futuh al Ghaib. Futuh al Ghaib. Futuh al Ghaib. Openings of the unseen. Now, generally, we, we believe that only Allah, He knows the unseen, the Ghaib. But it doesn't mean that type of Ghaib. It's not that Ghaib of Mutlaqan. Sometimes you get a Muslim and he or she doesn't pray, doesn't fast. They believe in the kalima, they believe in the Prophet and what he came with was the haq. But for some weak imam, they don't pray, they don't... Serious situation, bad situation, but inshallah, it's not a Muslim. And then one of the... Sometimes they say, oh, you know, I started praying the other day. Now it's been two, two weeks and I'm praying. And actually, Abu Alia, this is, happens to me a lot. Actually, Abu Alia, now that I prayed, 
I have more problems in my life than when I wasn't praying. But hold on, if I'm praying, I should have no problems in my life. Because otherwise I should be happy with me and my life should be... I should have no bills, I should have no... The wife not hassling me, the kids not hassling me. Promotion at work and all these nice things. Nothing. Now, and a person who, even not an alim, but any abid, any worshipper, any Muslim who has a basic knowledge of Islam and has been worshipping Allah for some time, will just know that actually that's not the way that Allah makes things work. And someone who is a little bit more sharp, he doesn't have to be an alim or a mufti, just a little bit, he's a bit learned in Islam, a little bit, he's, he will know that actually this is one of the ways that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to realize about our ikhlas. Do I want to make ibadah for, uh, to Allah so that my debts are cleared? Or do I want to make ibadah for Allah because He alone deserves ibadah? There is a difference between wanting the gifts of the king and wanting to be in the presence of the king. Both are good, but the second one is better. So sometimes Allah wants us to realize that actually, even if you don't get any good thing in dunya of this zahir ni'mah, but know that Allah deserves to be worshipped whatever. Not I'm feeling good today, so I will make salah, and then on Tuesday I feel a bit depressed and down, so I won't make salah. Actually, no, now that I am depressed and down, there's more reason why I should be like, I am making salah. Allah is, <coughs> sorry, Allah Jalla wa ala is to be worshipped, whether we're happy or we're sad, whether we're rich or we're poor, whether we've won the European Cup or whether we've not won the European Cup. <laughs> okay. Khalas. Now, I just want that attitude to understand because I don't want to just cheat 15th of Sha'aban. I want us to have an, an understanding of the nature of, of religious knowledge and of ulama and of differences so that we will be, we will be firm on our own selves if I believe this is haram, it's haram. For example, in the, uh, in the Hanbali school, based upon the hadith of Sulaik in Bukhari, uh, Sulaik radiallahu entered the masjid on Friday and the Prophet told him, uh, don't sit down until you pray two rakah. And then there's the other hadith, إِذَا uh, أَحْدُكُمْ uh, فَلَا يَجْلِسْ حَتَّى يُسَلِّيَ رَكَتَيْنِ When any of you enters the mosque, don't sit down until you pray two rakah. Now for the Hanbalis, on Jum'ah, Tahitul Masjid, Tahitul Masjid, according to Imam Ahmed and other Hanbali scholars, is wajib. Even if the Imam is given a khutbah. On other days, not Juma, normal days, it's sunnah or sunnah mu'akkadah. It's emphasis, it's a sunnah. But on Juma, it's, an ob it's, it's wajib, it's an obligation. Even when the Imam is given a khutbah. Now, I know the Hanafi opinion is that no, if the Imam is given a khutbah, based upon the fact that the hadith say, listen to the khutbah, you can't pray anything. Just sit down and listen to the imam. For me, as a follower of the humbly school, okay, if I sit down in Jum'ah without praying to Raka Tahrir masjid I will be sinful. But for Salim, who follows the Hanafi school, if he sits down, if he prays to Raka Tahrir masjid you will be sinful. I can't say that, oh, today I will sit down because I feel like being a Hanafi. Because that's just picking and choosing according to my nafs. And the sir, the secret of ittiba, the ulama say the secret of ittiba. Because if Allah wanted, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have just given us jannah without any ahkam, without any amr and nahi. But we have these amr and nahi, commands, prohibitions, commands, prohibitions. All the way back to our father, Adam alayhi salam. He only had one sharia. And that, the one sh he had a sharia and he only had one thing in his sharia. And what was that one thing in his sharia? Yeah, don't eat from the tree. Don't approach this tree. Khalas. Just one nahi, one, one, one haram thing for him. One of the reasons why we have commands and prohibitions is that not Allah knows, because Allah knows everything already, that we will know, we will have an idea of our submission to Allah. Because you see, when a Muslim, he doesn't pray for a few days, he doesn't pray for three or four days, he cannot say, ikhlasan, sidqan, I love Allah and I'm very obedient to Allah. And, I'm, I, and I have absolute yaqeen and my iman is very high. Why? Because there are certain things, missing the prayer, 
that tell us something else. Not saying that he is the devil, no. But his iman cannot be as good as when he was praying. And his sidq with Allah can't be as good as and and and. So it gives an indication and it's a way to check ourselves. When I'm disobedient to my parents, it gives me an idea that, ah, I am moving away from the pleasure of Allah. Because the nafs has one, one desire and Allah, he has another murad, he has another intention for us. And it's the murad of Allah that, must, <coughs> that we must give priority over our own murad. We should, we, should have, we, should have, we should be murid to the murad of Allah. We should aspire to the will of Allah, not to our own desires and will. And that's really important. So, for example, we had, uh, we had a discussion, and I just want to put it in context, about ghina and, and, and music, ghina and singing. And I, and I said, if you, please, I'd rather you not ask this question, if you remember. But then... The question was asked, and then I gave two views, and the majority view, and even, you know, I said that maybe the minority might even be a shah, the wrong view, but anyway. The issue is not, oh, did the sheikh, did Abu Alia, did the speaker make it hard or difficult? The issue, first and foremost, is, was he trustworthy enough to explain the Islamic position rightly or wrongly? And then let's just say it was an issue, for example, just now I had some guest around my house and one of the guests said you know I'm coming to a situation with my parents where we're having these arguments they're getting older and they're making wrong judgments because sometimes when you get old you say you make wrong judgments you get seen up and we're having arguments before we never used to have arguments so what can I could you maybe speak to my parents I said I, you know I said I will speak to your parents but before I speak to your parents let me speak to you about what I said you know what look you ha I know you, you have been serving your parents for so long. MashaAllah, very obedient. Now they're coming to the old age, the task is getting more difficult because they're more stubborn, more set in their ways and it's harder to explain things and they're less patient and so many things. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about when your parents, one of them or both of them reach old age. Because when, it's, when they're younger, it's kind of a, might be a bit easier. But when they get older, it's very difficult. When one of them or both of them reach old age, lower to them the wing of gentleness and humility. And do not say uff to them. And I could see on that person's face that they, alhamdulillah, that they knew, they knew that this is haq. And you could see on their face that, yes, this is what I have to do. They didn't say, ah, oh, make an excuse. They made it, they, in their hearts, they could see, you know what? I just want to follow the truth. I want to please Allah. I want to be a better human being. That's how we should be. If someone says to me nicely, and perhaps even privately, if it's one of Abu Ali, actually, you're doing this wrong. I hope, inshallah, bi'idhnillah, bi'idhnillah, that I could say, jazakallahu khairan, go home and try to make mujahid against my nafs to do the right thing. Because that's what Islam is about. Islam is about becoming a better person. Not any better person, better person according to the standards of the sunnah of Al-Mustafa, the chosen one, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. If, however, I'm saying something wrong or I have not expressed the correct scholarship, then, of course, you have the right to take me to task. This way, together, we'll better ourselves. You have strengths in certain places that we don't. And we may have strengths where you don't. You may have understandings where we don't. We may have understandings where you don't. And together we are mirrors. The Muslim is a, a mirror to his brother Muslim. Together we give nasiha. Together we say, you know what? Allah chose Al-Mustafa the chosen one, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as khayru khalqillah, the best of Allah's creation. And he gave him the best of books. And he made him the best of the prophets. And he made, he made around him the best of the ummas. <coughs> I want to be the best of people. Laylatul Nisma in Sha'ban, one more thing. Remember, the hadith says, Allah forgives everyone except the mushrik, meaning the non-Muslim, 
and the mushahin. And the mushahin is one who has uh, a problem or a sahaba, some grudge, grudge or enmity against his Muslim brother or sister, and there is no justification for it or little justification. Therefore, before the 15th of Sha'ban, today even, let's try to make sul. Islah dhat al bayn Rectify the affairs between us. It's reported in one of the narrations Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu was one day giving the hadith lessons. And so this particular day he came, he sat down and uh, he praised Allah and, uh, and he was just about to relate the, some hadith as was his normal habit. And the students were there, some of them were with pens. And uh, Abu Huraira said, no, actually anyone who has a problem with their parents, go now and sort out your problem, meaning seek their forgiveness and connect with your parents and come back after, well, after Dhuhr or whatever time he said. So they, the, the, the majlis resumed after Dhuhr. And just before he started, one of the students said, why did you say that? He said, because today my intention was to relate the hadith of the Prophet that he spoke about the virtues of parents and the obedience to parents. And I didn't want anyone in my class to be in a position of making mukhalaf of the hadith. That I'm telling you the hadith about the Prophet about where he said, be kind to parents. And actually in the majlis, there are there people who have disconnected from their parents. I wanted you to have the chance to connect so that we can take the learning of, of the hadith of the sunnah seriously. Point being is, Islam is really important. And this hadith is saying Allah forgives everyone except the mushahin. Even if I'm older and it's to my younger son, 20, 30 years younger than me. Let me be the first person to extend the hand of reconciliation. If we can overcome our nafs bi'ithnillah to reconcile between people that are distant, Allah will strengthen this ummah and we'll be people who can reconcile, make islah for the whole world. He saw some, even by the mushriks and the yahud, yahud of Medina and the mushriks of Medina, uh, of Makkah, they didn't believe in his nabuwa, in his prophethood, or his risala, his message. But they would turn to him, sallallahu alayhi wasallam, for Islam. Subhanallah. They had disputes, they would bring it because they knew he would be just, he would be wise, he would not be, unf he would not be unfair. So, Laylatul Nismin Sha'aban. Possibly, wallahu a'lam, I say this with a degree of caution, if I say anything wrong, clearly then mention. Perhaps making Islam between two Muslims is going to be more rewardful than making 10, 20 nawafil salawat rakats on that night. One, why? Because one is a fard, Islam, and the other one is a fadila, is a, is, is, it's encouraged, it's a virtue. And Allah loves the fara'id over and above the, uh, the, the non-farai, the, no, the nafila. Otherwise, that 15th night of Sha'ban from Wednesday Maghrib, at least try, let us try to pray two rakah, at least. Let's make a good wudu. Let's try to pray at least two rakah with as much concentration as possible. Maybe even beforehand, uh, read the surahs that I'm going to read in that in those surahs. Maybe قل هو الله أحد and قل عوض برب الناس or whatever it be. إذا جاء نصر الله. Whatever I want to read, or a larger or smaller, get the meaning so that when I am standing in prayer, I feel what I'm saying to Allah. And maybe even some, if the eyes don't, if the tears don't come from the eyes, but the heart is crying, the heart is weeping. And then after that, it's just make tawbah to Ya Allah. You are you are the forgiving. And I'm, you know, I, 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 I desperately need your forgiveness. That's our state. Maybe if we can't do anything more than that, just two rakah with a dua at the end. Subhanallah, at least let's try to do that and encourage our families uh, to do that, inshallah ta'ala. From Maghrib time uh, onwards, inshallah ta'ala. The later you leave it might be a bit better, but of course we have to take into consideration the weekday and waking up in the morning and fajr and and, and, and uh, college and exams and work. But that is the majority of opinion. This book will give you a number of scholarly fatwas of the past. Not really interested too much of the present, because those scholarly things have already been worked out in the past. It will give you 
uh, a few of the scholars who said, no, we don't do it, and it'll give you the scholars who say we do it, and their fatwas, and then it'll go on to the golden rule of different. Please, if you can read it, please do read it, inshallah ta'ala, uh, and benefit from it, and, and then give it to others, like Dr. Salim said, so they can benefit. Because one of the biggest issues today is sometimes the splits between us is sometimes because we don't know adab al ikhdilat adab al khilaf. And then the other problem is our nafs, which is not something that is going to be cleared up. So just that one point. The sir of ittiba is that Allah has given us these commands and prohibitions so that they can purify our soul. Because, for example, here I, here I am. I used to be a Christian or a Jew or a non-Muslim before and I used to love to drink wine. Really used to like to taste, mashallah, very nice. Then I become Muslim. Again, this is... A, Allah sabil mithal, not that I was a good thing. I was like, oh, that's funny. I thought it was parents. And now I become a Muslim, and, I, and I'm clear that Allah doesn't like wine drinking. By my, by my nature, I like wine drinking. But Allah has forbidden wine. So now, I have to make mujahidah. I have to spiritually strive against my nafs, so that I keep away from it. In the beginning it might be difficult, but Allah at some level will make it easy. Because Allah wants me to, and one, Allah's commands and prohibitions are not just, you know sometimes you have a, in the old days, you have, the master used to have a slave. And sometimes just to test, test the slave, the master might say, oh slave, hop on one leg. And the slave hop, yeah, so he's my slave, I'm his master. There's no fa'id, there's no benefit of the slave hopping on one leg. This is just there to reassure the master. When Allah gives us commands and prohibitions, he makes this fard, he makes this haram, he makes this... It's not like we're hopping on one leg. Everything that Allah gives us of commands or prohibitions, it's for our own benefit. It's not... Allah doesn't benefit from it. Allah is al-ghani. It's for our benefit. Keeping away from wine, there is an individual benefit, a social benefit. Praying the prayer, there's an individual benefit, there's a social benefit. Keeping away from riba, there's an uh, individual benefit, social benefit. Obedience to parents, there's an individual benefit and social. And, 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 and. So the sir of ittiba is actually, the secret of, 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 of having these rules is actually, it helps to refine the nafs, the soul. It is a tarbiyat of nafs. And, the, and that is why the ulama will tell us, any journey to Allah spiritual journey, ruhani journey, must have as its also ittiba sharia following the, the, the injunctions of the sacred law because it is there designed to purify our souls and then the extra dhikr and the extra nawafil and the ibadah and the husn khuluq and, and the husn nadr then that's there to make it even more perfect so we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that in this month especially and on the 15th uh, in general and the 15th night of Sha'ban on Wednesday night that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us a tawfiq for ibadah we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he give us a uh, fiqh of the deen a good understanding of the deen we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he help us uh, overcome our nafs and make us people who bind hearts together not split hearts together we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in those things that we find difficult in the sharia and the sunnah then we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rather than us our nafs finding excuses not to do it, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us tawfiq to do it. And our intention should be, whatever of the sunnah I can't follow, maybe because it's ghayr munasib now, or it's more harm than good given the society, or this, but in my heart I should have that. <coughs> the, the way of life of al-Mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa khayru khalqillah. And yesterday we did the mi'raj, in the in Sheikh Ahmed's class, where he goes past a Sidratul Muntaha, and no creature has passed the Sidratul Muntaha, and this and he comes closer to as uh, to the length of Kaaba Qawsain, two bows lengths. Subhanallah. <coughs> no Burak, no Jibril, no, just he Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah, Allah, and his Habib Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Surely that must be the way of life that we want to follow. Surely that must be the way of dignified, noble character. And anything other than that is not as noble or not even noble. 
We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for tawfiq, which is Allah khaim. Allahumma aslih dhata bainana wa janna minal rashidin. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasna wa fila akliti hasna wa qina adhaab al-nar. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun. Wa salamu ala al-mursaleen. Wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Any questions? Bismillah. Well, question arises, forgive me, I'm not questioning anybody. It's all last 50 years, <laughs> comments from everywhere. <laughs> um, um, I see that there are some hadiths as well that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes near to every present time as well, nearer to it. So whether that is something special on that particular night or every night, Absolutely. number one. Absolutely. Number two is that um, it's my, maybe my lack of knowledge. I understand the Arabic world in general don't recognize this particular night as such in their behavior. I, I may be wrong, but I heard so much so. And third thing is this, is there any other um, things we could do? Uh, oh, sorry, I heard something that this, uh, something is present to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on that day. Last year's work or next year's work, Jay, etc. Excellent. etc. Mm -hmm. I need to know slightly more on the this place. Um, the three questions are first and foremost, or not in that order, uh, is the decree of the year, the decree of the year, uh, made on this particular night? Uh, of the middle night of Sha'ban, that's one question. Second question is, uh, is it true that most of the Arab world don't actually hold this night uh, as a distinction, a distinctive night? And the, uh, the first question was, the first question was? <laughs> Testing him. Before, before yes. Oh yes, they, yeah, the, 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 the Nuzul. The, the Nuzul, okay. As regards to the first question, uh, yes, uh, the hadith in Bukhari and Muslim and other places are well agreed upon that Allah, blessed is he, descends to the uh, lowest heaven every last third of the night, every night. And he says, who is there who is asking that I may give, seeking my forgiveness that I may forgive, and asking of my mercy that I may give mercy. And this happens until the coming of the dawn. So every night is a auspicious night as far as we're concerned, but some nights are even more auspicious. And this is out of the fadl of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the ummah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that he gives this, this chance. No, that might have a much longer period. Uh, um, well, it's... Uh, even though, uh, even though tahajjud is considered to be any time in the night up until the dawn, but the, there, is an even, there are preferable times and even more preferable times to pray tahajjud in the last third of the night. The night prayer, the qiyamul layl, the ideal time to pray it is in the last third of the night, but, but it can be prayed okay, uh, any time from the first part of the night until the end. But the ideal time is the last third. And that's what those hadiths are referring to. And that's not against this particular hadith of Sha'ban or the hadith of Le or Laylatul Qadr or anything like that. One thing. Second thing is, whether or not the Arab world celebrated or not, that wouldn't really be an issue. However, you may find that the majority of Syrian scholars, Wallahu alim, the majority of Egyptian scholars, the majority of Jordanian scholars, it's possible you might find the majority of the Maghribi scholars, Wallahu alim, uh, they would hold this, but certainly if you went back in a time machine 100 years ago, you would find that it would be in the majority opinion of the scholars across the world, including in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. So that's not that. So I don't really want to get into whether the majority, especially since the 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 uh, the, the Arab world present, uh, represents the the least percentage of Muslims, and possibly the least percentage percentage of Muslim scholarship. You probably have more scholars in, 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 in uh, the Maghrib and North Africa than you do in the Middle East. Wallah am. Okay. And the third one is, uh, the third question was... Action last year or the next year. Yes. There is an opinion, going back to uh, Ikrama or one of the Tabi'un, that he said, according to his understanding, that uh, this is this night... The year's decree, not the whole life's decree, is actually, uh, is actually written on this day, day or rewritten on this day. Not rewritten, but written on this day. However, that is uh, considered to be a, a, a weak report because Ikrama also says that that night is Laylatul Qadr. And it's based upon a, a verse in the Quran which says, on this night, the decrees are, 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 are laid out. 
the majority opinion in our books of tafsir, like Ibn Kathir and Qutubi and Tabari and whatever, the majority opinion says that the, the night when the decree is written is the night of Laylatul Qadr. That is the majority opinion by far. It is actually the, 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 the overwhelming majority opinion. However, there is this one small opinion, but inshallah, we can happily ignore that. One more thing. There is a practice. I still think it's in vogue in some Muslim countries, but it's almost kind of been overcome that some people believe that there is a special prayer on the 15th of night, a prayer, and they call it Salatul al fiyah the prayer of a thousand qurs, that they think that they should pray a hundred rak'ahs, and in the hundred rak'ahs you do a thousand qul hu Allahu ahads. Uh, many of our scholars, muhaqqiqun, like Mullah Ali al-Qari, like Imam al suyuti like Sheikh Islam ibn Taymiyyah, like Imam Nawawi, and others, rahimahullah ajma'in, they have shown why this practice is, uh, is actually baseless, and it only comes into the Ummah in a certain part of the Islamic world uh, in the 5th century onwards. Otherwise, there is no specific Salat for the middle night of Sha'ban. There is just general Salat, Nafil, Nafil, as many or as few as you want to do, and Dua, Istighfar, Quran, being kind to parents, or any Amal which is Khayr. Okay? Lighting candles we don't do and whatever, but the majority opinion is that you do... Uh, it's encouraged to fast on the following day, and that's the majority opinion. Not one of um, um, so we'll take we'll take the brother's question there, inshallah. So we'll take the brother's question there. Uh, as we are following the four imams, as we are, you know, all the Muslims, like my family, they are belong to uh, my own society. They belong to Ali Sunnah, the Abu Hanifa, some Abu Ham. Is it? All these things, uh, what they said basically, there was their opinion. Right. According to anything like some people said, that, uh, burn your uh, hands up and down or like that. But there was an uh, opinion. It's, I can't follow the uh, opinion of different amounts. Like if I, opinion, one uh, opinion I like Abu Hanifa, Imam Abu Hanifa, and one opinion about uh, Imam Hamal. So I can or not. Why people do only one side and ignore the other one? It's a good question. Why, uh, why do some people, why do the majority of people and scholars exist, uh, insist on following only one of the four Sunni schools of law? Hanfi, Maliki, Shafi, Hanbali. Uh, and why can't, can't a Muslim just um, follow all of them and pick and choose and whatever? This is a good question. We've touched upon it before. Uh, we might even have had a talk upon it before. But uh, if you excuse me, I don't really want to get into it again because... Um, my experience is that it needs to be answered in some detail and um, I don't want it to blur the topic today. So this is a good question, it has a clear answer and I did a whole course about this uh, not some months ago. Um, if perhaps after Ramadan uh, we can find a good spot, I'd like to do a talk on that. But in the meantime, if you go to the Jolzia website, jolzia.com, uh, you can find some discussion on it. And also, if you, uh, if you get the book, Understanding the Four Madhabs by Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad, small little booklet, even smaller than this, this will be useful for you, inshallah ta'ala. I have heard about uh, one Sheikh who, was, uh, who issued a booklet on this in, back in 1930s when a Japanese... Muslim uh, converted to Islam, and he was uh, faced with these four madhahib, and there was some uh, opinion given on how to overcome the situation. But I tried with IDCI and others because I read about that booklet. Unfortunately, it's out of print or something. Are you aware of that? Uh, not only am I probably aware of it, uh, I probably... I, uh, I lived in the 1930s, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> you, you took the words right out of my mouth. Uh, first and foremost, uh, uh, um, uh, a small little history. The book is by uh, Sheikh Sultan al-Ma'asumi, uh, who is uh, one of those kind of Turkic, not Turk, maybe not necessarily Turkish, but Turkic kind of scholars. And he wrote a book called uh, are the Muslims obligated to follow one of the four Sunni schools? Uh, in our time, uh, in our time, Sheikh Al-Bani did a type of tahqiq to the manuscript, and then one of his students, one of his younger, younger students, Sheikh Salim Al-Hilali, brought it out in popular print. 
So back in uh, around about 1990, uh, myself and uh, one or two brothers, we set about getting it translated, and we did. Uh, within a year after its translation, I was pretty convinced how, um, how inappropriate that book was. But that book became very popular in its original print, and it, it was printed by, translated and printed by Al Hidayah. Uh, the brothers in Hidayah, and they asked me, should it be like this, should it be like that? And that was one of their first books, and they asked me, and I said, this should be one of your first books. Within a year or two, I kind of, uh, more, within less than a year, I kind of regretted that. Uh, it then got print, reprinted uh, in a new translation, a, a, a lesser scholarly translation, by uh, Darus Salam back in, like, 96, 98, about 98. And Darul Salam is a, you know, one, they don't print 5,000 or 3,000, they print 50,000. So it went round like that. So I think it had revived. But between 91 when it was released, or 90, 91 when it was released, to 93, 4, I spoke to Al Hidayah and I spoke to the original translator of the book. And I said to them that there are things in there that are so um, not well written and actually misleading and actually saying something that shouldn't be said uh, that I think uh, my suggestion to you is to remove it from the shelves and Al Hidayah obliged me and they removed it from their shelves back in 92, 93 and never reprinted again but Dar es Salaam went and reprinted it you know whatever uh, and actually that book doesn't represent mainstream Sunni Islam and it has two or three serious problems uh, in how it states the case in its 30 small chapters so it's a book that I would highly discourage to the max of anyone to read because actually there are, there are four or five blatant mistakes there that a good student could spot, let alone scholar. And this is why Sheikh al-Albani, when he is asked about this book by one of the Syrian scholars, perhaps it's Sheikh Ramadan al-Buti or, so, or, or someone else, and they're having a munaqasha. You can even see Sheikh al-Albani, who's quite a, who quite likes the Sheikh and this particular booklet, even he is kind of on the back foot making all these excuses. And at one point, Sheikh Al-Bani says, well, yes, he did say this, and it's true, that's totally wrong, but he actually meant the opposite. And the other Sheikh is saying, how can a person who is skilled in Arabic write something and say, this is haram, and actually he doesn't mean this is haram, he means this is allowed. <laughs> and it became quite an embarrassment, actually, uh, in that discussion, actually, because you could see that it was just trying too hard. So Sheikh Sultan Ma'asumi's book, uh, which he wrote because these Japanese Muslims, they were presented with, shall I be, you know, I have to be Hanafi, I have to be this, have to, and they got really confused, and then he's, mashallah, uh, um, you know, we can't judge his intentions, and the Sheikh is a scholar, rahmatullah alayhi, al-Ma'asumi, rahmatullah alayhi, uh, but he wasn't Ma'asum in this. Okay, uh, he didn't have isma in this. Uh, he Ma'asum and al-Khita on the basis that his intention was right. Barakallah fikum. And uh, inshallah ta'ala, and we still would respect his scholarship, but that particular risala or book is not a book that should be encouraged to read in any language, uh, well, let alone... The, and maybe the divine will is working in a way that you, we can't find it in print anymore. <laughs> and that would be a really good thing for the ummah here if it stayed out of print, and Allah knows best. If someone wanted in, in private time, go through the book, because I have, I have a copy of the book, I have the original copy. Uh, I could point out the things, because I then started teaching from that book of the correct kind of thing, since the book became popular in certain areas and certain people of my, my generation, and it was easier to take that text and actually go through why this is mistaken or whatever. The, the, the minimum it caused many thousands of people, Arab-speaking and English-speaking and whatever other to believe that they can go directly to the book and the sunnah without scholarly help and actually make ahkam, actually come up with religious verdicts. And he, in two or three places, he makes that almost explicit. Uh, so it's not a really book that the scholars would... Well, isn't Asad saying the same thing in uh, this uh, law of ours? Yeah, uh, Muhammad Asad, rahmatullahi he's not an alim from the ulama. Uh, and you know his writings. You know the road to Makkah is a, is a, is a classic <laughs> milestone. The Mecca, yeah, but the, the, law, our law, the, absolutely, this, this law, law of ours. ours. It was an attempt, inshallah. But we should take our knowledge of these things from the ulama and the fuqaha. Some people have, mashallah. Some people have beautiful contributions to Islam, but we just need to make tamiz distinction between 
scholarly contributions and non-scholarly things. There are many people who are educated awam, and they say many good things, alhamdulillah, and we can take istifada, benefit. But when it comes to detailed ahkam and rulings and theology and law, we need to go back to the ulama. Okay? And so, rahmatullah alayhi to... Prophet Sallallahu time, they had the teacher present himself, and they followed the instructions directly from the fountain. But after that, obviously, it's the Sahaba and the Tabi'un who narrated and continued the message. The message was given to the desert people who were only like the Prophet, the majority of them. And it is the simplest of message to the simplest of people who then changed into the most best of nations. So to make it more complicated by what you are saying that ordinary people cannot understand, I think it is something where Allah wanted the ordinary people to understand. He sent the teacher and the teacher and his teachings and his sunnah is there for us to guide rather than the four Imams who we have taken and stopped the development of thought process after that and we have said no more just taqlid. Why not the thought process? Why not the ishtihad for the times now? Why stop at 1000 years ago? This is my question to you. Um, because it's related directly there, I'll make it a brief comment. And then we'll explore this, I think, yeah, in a talk. Particularly following from that. Yeah. Uh, so uh, since I could, uh, what I'll do is I'll make some brief points, and then maybe after Ramadan, we can actually have a real session about this, inshallah. Very briefly, there are. We can divide the Quran in two. This is just for explanation purpose. We can divide the Quran in two. Those things that anyone can understand, whether he's an alim, ami, whether he's a layperson, whether he's a scholar, whether he's a Muslim or a non-Muslim. And those things of the Qur'an are things about Allah is one, his tawheed, there is an after, uh, uh, akhirah and a hisab, be good to parents, don't steal, speak truth. And many non-Muslims become Muslims by reading the Qur'an or hearing it, and they understand its message. And from the time of the Prophet ﷺ up until now, that continues to happen. And in that sense... Everyone is encouraged to read the Qur'an or an English or some translation of it, some good translation of it, to get the overall ideas. And we have left even doing that. However, when it comes to the detailed rulings, the masail, the issues of uh, wiratha, which are in the Qur'an, the issues of uh, iqam salah establishing the prayer, the issues of Ramadan and what makes the fast valid and what makes the fast invalid, the issues of buying and selling, the issues of marriage and divorce, and what makes something uh, sahih or batil. All of those detailed things, the Prophet ﷺ in his lifetime didn't allow the lay people to make their own ruling, didn't allow the Sahaba to make their own rulings. This is why in the Hadith literature you can find only 12 or 13 muftis from the Sahaba when there is over 12,000 Sahaba radiallahu anhum ajma'in. Uh, and so there are some details that have to go back to the ulama. The ahkam uh, tafsiliya, which we call fiqh. We cannot go and make them up ourselves. So if someone says, you cannot read the Qur'an at all, only a scholar can, there is haqq and batil in there. There's right and wrong, truth and falsehood. Anyone can read the Qur'an for its overall message and even become a Muslim, even if he's not a Muslim. Okay? But if they mean that we can go to the Qur'an and get the detailed rulings, or the hadith for that matter, then actually they are gone against what the Prophet has taught. So that's to, uh, to make that distinction. The other thing is, the gates of ijtihad have, are not closed. The jurists continue to do ijtihad. And it's their haq, it's their right. Ijtihad, for want of a better dis, uh, 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 phrase, is uh, drawing new rulings, take, getting new rulings from the religious sources for new situations. And that continues to happen. Our whole finance, with it, very few scholars teach fiqh al as a practical way uh, in the classical books of fiqh because 
much of that transaction, you might get it somewhere in some village in Morocco and some village in Pakistan and some village in Timbuktu. But the majority of the Muslim cities, they have modern transactions. And the scholars, the fuqaha, are trying to sort out the right transactions from the wrong according to the sharia. So ijtihad is going on. <laughs> so it's not stopped. Uh, there are some people who are saying, all right, um, you know, we have the madhabs, but even those madhab scholars, they do ijtihad. Biggest proof of that, look at many of the Hanafi scholars who insist, who insist. I'll, I'll give you an example. The Hanafi scholars of the subcontinent, and I'm not a Hanafi, the Hanafi scholars of the Indian subcontinent, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, they, nearly all of them insist that you have to follow um, quite strictly a single school. And yet those scholars were coming out with Islamic rulings on finance before the Saudi scholars in Mecca even knew what was going on by 30, 40, 50, 60 years. Some of the scholars in Egypt were coming out with fatwas for the modern day Okay, some of the uh, uh, Shaltut, Sheikh Shaltut in Egypt and before him and after him, before anywhere in the Middle East even woke up. Okay, so you have Hanafi scholars who tell you to follow, follow the Madhab, but what they mean is in the Ibadat, stick to what is, you know, praying, fasting, wudu, hajj, just stick to the school because that's not going to change more or less. But as you go to the Mu'amalat, which is going to, uh, which it's hard to follow. Uh, lock, stock, and we're making ijtihad. So they mean making ijtihad upon the basis of the teachings and the principles and the qawaid of the madhab. Because it has the, a, a fiqhi ruling, a juristic ruling, has to be based upon principles, maxims, rules, and all of those come from a particular way of looking at the source texts. So that's generally what they mean. I don't know of any scholar who means by stick to a mother, that actually the way that the, I don't know, uh, what's the, what's the Marghinani, what's Marghinani, what's the what's Marghinani's text? The Hidayah, which is one of the Hanafi's main texts, but written by Al-Marghinani, somewhere in Central Asia, that actually stick to everything in Marghinani and not adapt it to anything. I don't know any scholar who says that, but when they say stick to a mother, they talk, generally talk about the lay person vis-a-vis -vis the basic, t the basic, uh, five pillars of Islam generally and some things of marriage and things like that so uh, it's actually uh, and what's the alternative the, the question to ask is what's the alternative if you and I know you don't mean this but if you take the madhabs and the fiqh away and say we're going to start from first principles subhanallah that's like reinventing the will it's not going to happen and it can't happen or the other alternative I'll just read a hadith and get religious rulings. Well, actually, uh, suicide bombing is a perfect example of that type of fiqh. If you argue, if you argue with any one of these people, okay, and I've had the, the, the pleasure and displeasure, normally it's the displeasure, of one day trying to sit down with Faisal, Sheikh Faisal they call him, and he got expelled from this country some years ago, um, because he used to come to me in say, have I said anything wrong in the circles? And I'd have to go back and say, actually, yes, you have. And his justification was for this allowance, some many years ago, is uh, there is a hadith in the Sunnah of Abu Dawood that uh, civilians were killed. And he's right. But the fiqh of that hadith, the understanding of that hadith, is totally different because of other hadiths. So all I'm saying is, uh, some scholars need to wake up, because there is some rigidity, some scholars have woken up, but they found, well, the issue is really hard. So they're moving in the right direction, but quite slowly. And some scholars, mashallah, they're quite on the board. However, there are a few who come under the guise of scholarship who are charlatans. And they are making things that are clearly haram, halal, and vice versa. Without any rules, without any consistency, without any fiqh. The best book on this subject that I know so far, it's a classical book written by the Indian scholar Shah Waliullah Dehlawi and he wrote a small risala, treatise, which is in English as well as Urdu, as well as Arabic. Al-Insaf fi bayan sabab al-ikhtilaf The just uh, explanation in why the imams and the madhabs differ. And he will explain to you why 
from the before the fourth century, uh, clinging to a single madhab was not the norm. It's not that it wasn't there, but it wasn't the norm. And after the fourth century, why the vast majority of scholars either said it was an obligation or preferred it. And if you read that book or or a larger discussion in the Hujjatul Al Baligh, I think he makes things really beautifully clear. And it's a book that I'll, I'll encourage everyone to read. And there's an English translation of it as well. And those of you who speak Urdu, he wrote it in the original. You know, when Urdu in the 17th century was half Urdu, half scat, you know, quarter Urdu, quarter Sanskrit, quarter Persian, quarter Arabic. So it's not the Urdu that we know now. So even you can get that one available. But Alhamdulillah, there's a normal Urdu translation of it as well as an English translation. Uh, may Allah, we, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we ask Allah for tawfiq because we are in difficult circumstances. We need our scholars to be sharp on the board. But... Whatever we take away from this majlis of 15th of Sha'ban, let's take away this. The idea is to accept the truth wherever it comes from. The idea is if the truth isn't clear and it gives more than one legitimate opinion, be tolerant. And the idea is know that we need to support the ulama and pray for their strength and guidance because a type of unhealthy modernism that has come which is doing away with jurisprudence, will not beget us anything other than woe, spiritual corruption, and liberal bank bankruptcy. Okay? And make a distinction between an alim who's come from a village, and he's an alim, and all he knows is that text. He doesn't represent true scholarship. MashaAllah, he can teach people Alif Bata, ABC. He can lead the prayer. When he makes a mistake in the prayer and he, uh, he, doesn't, he doesn't sit down for the second rakah instead, he will know what to do. He'll know to make sajda sahu here or there and what to do. And that's fantastic. And he'll make your prayer sound, bi'idhnillah. And many of you won't know how to make your prayer sound if you did that. But he won't be able to tell you about finance. He won't be able to tell you about liberalization. He won't be, t be able to tell you about anything of the isms of modernism, of capitalism, of consumerism, of whateverism it is. But that's not a reflection on scholarship. That's just a reflection on him as an individual. And Allah knows best. May Allah guide us to just paths that please him. Just in 30 seconds, if you could tell what not to do in 15 chapter. Uh, yes, please don't do uh, the prayer of a thousand quls because it has no basis, Salat al uh, please uh, try not to believe that the decree is written down on this uh, night because the de decree is written down on the night of Laylul Qadr. Please try not to have an argument with any, any person, especially a Muslim, because it kind of defeats the hadith uh, on that. And please just uh, try to keep a, uh, awake that night, even for two rakahs, if not longer, so that we can draw closer to Allah um, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, that's more, uh, and, and try not to get in this habit of lighting candles and, and don't think that's going to happen and fireworks and right. halwa and whatever for that specific <laughs> night if you're making halwa anyway you know, then do so and remember I live at 28 Windermere Gardens <laughs> but otherwise don't worry about the halwa Jazakallah khair subhanallah wa bihamdi subhanallah jadallah wa bihamdi wa may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you Ah, yes. Thirty seconds. Thirty seconds. Thirty seconds.